As dads, some days we feel like we have all the answers, and some days we feel like we don't have a clue. If that describes you, you're at the right place. This is the All Pro Dad Podcast. And speaking of being an All Pro Dad, we have the founder of All Pro Dad, Mr. Mark Merrill. Mark, thanks for joining us again. Hey, hey. Always good to be with you guys. So each episode, we'll give one question, just one question. Uh, for us to talk about and wrestle with it a little bit, and then a bottom line, and at the end, a, a pro move that's going to be powerful, but it's going to be doable in the real world. And Bobby, what's the big question of the day? The big question of the day is, what are the seven things that a son needs from his dad? Seven things, all very important. And, and these are not like food, shelter, you know, clothing, you know, obviously those are basic human needs. These are like relational things, things that every son needs to get from his dad. Why do you guys think that that resonate with people so much? I think we're, I mean, we were all sons at one time and navigating what it, how to become a man. Um, and some dads did that really well. Um, for us, with us. Um, other dads were either not present or had no clue how to do that. Mm. And so it's one of those things, I think, when we become a dad ourselves, that we want to get right, mm. that we want to do it well. We want to take our sons into manhood, um, whether we had it or we didn't have it. I don't know why all dads resonate and run to this article uh, and have over the years, but I, my hope is that it's because they recognize that what they're doing is a big deal. Mm. That it matters. That being a good dad actually is a determining factor in how life goes for your children. And I think and I hope that that's why they're they're gravitating to this article. That's good. Mark, what about you? Yeah, I think one of the things is a little commercial break for All Pro Dad uh, that we have done well for the last uh, 25 years is really synthesize things down to what are the most important things. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, Dad's not only so said, yeah, I need to understand what are those seven uh, things that my son needs from me so that he could be really clear on that. Because as you said, BJ, uh, a lot of men out there didn't have that dad that conveyed it. So these dads want to know, what is that? What did I miss? Or what did I get uh, from my dad uh, that were really good things? And this really supplements that and it gives them the clarity of these are the seven really, really important things that you need to convey to your son. What about you guys? How did your dad meet? What need do you feel like you, that your dad met really well? That was an easy one. When you said it, I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And it was, son, I love you. Mm -hmm. And he said it over and over again every day. And he showed it. And I knew that in the depths of my heart and soul that he loved me and there was nothing that I could do to change that. Yeah. Bobby, what about you? You know, my parents divorced when I was five-ish, five, six years old, something like that. And so the man I called dad is my stepfather. Mm -hmm. And he and my mom got married when I was about 10 or so. And what was interesting to me as I grew up, like I knew from a very young age, having gone through uh, or being a child of divorce, that like divorce was never an option for me. Like when I was old enough to get married, that that was just not going to happen because I'd seen how you know tough it was for one of my mom, but also for uh, the children. And so when my stepdad comes along, what I really learned from him and appreciated from him was stability, mm. like like a rock in your family. Like, all right, it didn't work the first time. Like there were some fractures here, mm. but this here, this is a rock, this mm. is solid. And that is really an important lesson that I learned that like you can get it right the first time. And, and I wanted to do that. And I learned that by my mom going through it the second time, you know? Mm. So I thought it was cool. You got to watch it done right. Yeah. I got to see it done right. It wasn't necessarily done right, you know, the way that I pictured it, but it was done right for me, mm. you know? It's good. Hmm. Um, my dad was present. I think that's, uh, like he was, he was, he did sales and would be gone for three weeks at a time. Um, and then, but when he was home, he would be at, he'd, he'd come to my soccer practice when I was in high school and sit on the bleachers for three hours, mm. just watching. He, uh, when I came home at night on a Friday night, he'd have the chess board out and have the candles going. And mm -hmm. I knew we were going to play chess for hours. Uh, we'd play golf together and sit in the golf cart. And Did he let you win? 
never <laughs> no no and i don't i don't let anyone win either yeah. like i don't let my kids win either so when i finally did beat him it was like i knew i had accomplished something great nice mm. so we're talking about the seven things i think my dad as we dive into these did number one really well he says he needs you to love his mother um my mom actually passed away when i was 10 and my dad remarried when i was 18 and uh I watched my dad. He loved my mother. Now, when you, th my dad's a man's man. He's a fifth generation farmer. So everything you put with that stereotypically in your head, that was it. He was a man of few words. He was a hard worker. Um, not touchy feely. Did not, didn't know how to emote with words with me. Uh, but I'm telling you, I never doubted that he loved my mother. Very, very affectionate with her. He thought she was the funniest person alive. He's very introverted. She's very extroverted. And I could see, and, you know, she, again, she passed away when I was 10, but I can remember the delight in his eyes when my mom would be making people laugh, which yeah. was quite often. Um, and so then he married a very different personality, and he has loved her well. Like, I've watched him change, like, styles. Like, my, my stepmom loves those cards from Hallmark. You go, who's still buying these? My stepmom. Uh, <laughs> or who buys the stuff in the Cracker Barrel store? My stepmom. But my dad will go and get her these cards. I'm not sure he reads them, but they look just like the ones she gives him. So he's a smart man. But I've watched him be a husband to two very different women. So I've, yeah. I've watched that well. Uh, so the first one is, uh, he needs you to love his um, his mother, BJ. I think you have a, a story. Yeah. On so I, when I was in my 20s, I got to know these uh, a group of families really well. And at one point, one of the dads, and I wasn't there for this. I heard the story later. In fact, I heard it from the mom. Um, but the dad was disciplining the teenage boy. And... Um, when he left, the mom was like, okay, you know, you know how your dad can be. He can be a little like hard. And the son stopped the mom and said, hey, mom, I need you to be on dad's team. Wow. Um, wow. He, he's <laughs> like, wow. he said, dad and I are going to be fine. Um, but it does more for me for you to be on dad's team than whatever, what whatever, sure thi whatever this is. Wow. And, wow. and so that, that's always a reminder to me that, when when the dad and the mom are on the same page, it gives a great amount of security to kids. Mm -hmm. And and some of the guys listening are going to be like, well, great, my wife and I are divorced or, you know, like, or, or and she's crazy and I have a hard time. But you can do the best that you can mm -hmm. to get along, to parent well together, to, you know, you just got to do whatever you can to kind of make that relationship right. Yeah, and the word here is love. He needs you to love his mother. And if, you know, you have separated and you're, you're not divorced anymore. You can still love by respecting. Mm, I think that's, that's a way that you can still show love. Mm, that's good. BJ, I love what, what you said about, uh, about that. They need you to love his mother and that mom and dad need to be on the same team. And really, uh, for all these seven things, we need to say, well, why is that important? Well, one of the reasons why it's important is what you just said. And I, I think we need to really put an exclamation point on this is that security. It says, hey, mom and dad are on the same team. Hey, mom and dad are getting along together and they're working together. Therefore, I feel secure. I feel okay. I feel safe as a child. And I don't need to worry about that like all my other friends. Mm -hmm. And how many of us has your child gone to you and said, I I after perhaps you had an argument, never forget it. One of my kids, actually it didn't just happen once, happened several times. One of my daughters, mm -hmm. Susan and I had gotten into a disagreement, an argument, and uh, she came, uh, I was tucking her in bed that evening and she said, are you and mom gonna get a divorce? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. absolutely not, we are committed together for life and by god's grace that's exactly what we're going to do and with that she just put her head on her pillow and mm -hmm. went right to sleep she mm -hmm. needed that assurance, assurance mm -hmm. that things were okay that she could rest securely that mom and dad were always going to be together and they were going to be together for her God, that's that's a great yeah. point and because kids are seeing it with their friends families right like if it's not happening in our house mm -hmm. they're seeing mm -hmm. secure well if it's happening to my friends so that's good to even reassure uh, even if we know it's never an option, maybe maybe they don't. Number two is they need to see you fail and not just succeed. <laughs> yeah, I failed last week pretty pretty epically, actually. Uh, I was trying to jump the battery on a dead battery on one car, and I hooked the 
stuff backwards. Like I Ooh. didn't do the negative deposit. I, I wasn't paying attention. I was trying to do it fast. So our one car that was working, I tried to hook up the battery to the car that wasn't working and started a car fire on the top of the battery of the car that was working. And I was like, in the moment, I was like, I didn't expect this to happen. Now, what do we do? And my yeah. son was standing right there because he's like, ooh, let me see how this works, dad. And I totally blew it right in front of him. We got the fire put out. It wasn't a big deal. We got it fixed. We changed the battery and everything was fine. But like we were driving down the road and I was like, this might be a good opportunity. And I said, that wasn't good, was it? He goes, no, that was scary. <laughs> I said, well, sometimes you make mistakes and that's okay. Like we learn from the mistakes. I'll never do it again. I will double right. check, triple check to make sure I don't do that. But just the failure, I, I, I felt stupid in the moment because it's such a, in my eyes, it was a silly mistake. I shouldn't have done that. But it was a great opportunity to open the door to have a conversation with them say, yeah, even dad screwed up and it's okay. Like sometimes you make a mistake and learn from that, get better. That's good. Hmm. Yeah, I, I sometimes I think it's just not even just failure. It's how we fail. Like mm -hmm. the fact that, like I, I'll never forget about a year before my dad died, we were talking about his life and he said, I've, I'm pretty much a failure. Like he mm. defined himself that way. Mm. And I thought, boy, that's, I, I became kind of sad and brokenhearted about that. Mm. But if he, you know, it, it would have been a little bit different if he had talked about, I have failed so many times in my life um, and been okay. Like it's okay. Mm. Um, you know, then it gives, I think our sons a little bit more permission to risk and failure's all right. Like we can go out and fail. There's a great movie, mm -hmm. uh, the kid's movie, I can't remember what it's called. The Robertsons, I think, where yeah. they're like, go fail. And they meet celebrate the it. You yeah. meet the Robertsons. Yeah. Meet the Robertsons. Yeah. And they say, uh, you know, like, go fail at something. You know, mm. they kind of celebrate it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. It's, so you're saying, BJ, just double click on that for just a second. You're saying, hey, it's not, we're going to fail. I mean, it's not like going, well, we got to make sure we do one of those so they can see that happen. Mm. And let's try to fake that out. Like, we're going to do it. You're saying it's how we do it and how we talk about ourselves right afterwards and can i supplement that as well Please. ted it's not just they need to uh, see us fail but they need to see how we respond to that failure mm -hmm. and uh, i believe it was chuck swindoll that said one time success is moving from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm mm -hmm. and so our kids our sons especially need to see um, when we do fail, how do we respond? So for example, I can't tell you how many times when I had said something to Susan that wasn't nice, that wasn't kind, and, uh, and I blew it in front of my kids. And so I failed. And I not only uh, asked for forgiveness to Susan in front of them, but I asked my kids for forgiveness as well, because they witnessed that. Yeah. And, I, and so they, they, they saw me fail, but then they saw how I responded to that failure in seeking forgiveness. And then, of course, hopefully turning the other way and not continuing to do that again. Mm, it's so good. That's so good. And we've talked about this on the podcast before. Uh, you know, our kids, I think, are going to be good at apologizing because we've had to do it so much at our house. And I <laughs> yeah. wish I was exaggerating. I am not. Yeah. Uh, uh, number three, he needs your servant leadership. Mark, would you define what you think that means, servant leadership? I think what we need to be careful about is that term has been used so much over the last 10 years, it almost becomes, yeah, I'm a servant leader or servant leadership. And we kind of gloss over that. And so I just would rather say we're to be servants. Mm. Uh, you know, that's what God has called us to do, to be his servants, his followers, and to serve other people well. So it's, and it's fine, by the way, to say servant leadership. Right. So I'm not trying to just wordsmith mm. this thing, but basically really, that's really what love is all about. Love is all about giving. It's all about serving selflessly and sacrificially to another person. And so I'm gonna say that if we want to define this term servant leadership, it really is, really it's all about loving other people well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's you're putting yourself second. You're, you're okay, what what can I do for other people? What can I do for the best? You know, well, what's the what's the best for everybody else? Mm -hmm. Like, how can I, how can I bring out the best in other people? It's being thoughtful of others mm -hmm. and particularly with, you know, uh, with our kids, with our wives, it's okay. Well, what's 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 the best thing for them in this moment, rather than what's the best thing for me in this moment? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yep, 
It's good. No, I agree. Yeah. I, I think that kids in general, um, it's just human nature. Maybe when you're younger, you just expect things. Mom and dad are going to do things. They're going to get things from mom and dad. But I think when we go out of our way to not just do things for them, but do things for other people, then they'll see, oh, this is not just a natural order of things where mom and dad just do stuff for us as kids, but they prioritize doing things for others. That they're not selfish. They're actually thinking about the people around them. I think that's an important lesson. That's good. And they can observe that. You can tell them, but they can also observe you doing it. And I think that's a good thing. Mm. I think my dad was really great at this. It's just naturally who he is. I don't even think it's have the choice. He's always going to put himself behind everybody else. He's mm-hmm. on every situation. He's always going to be the last one to eat. He's always going to be, I don't want to be in anyone's way at any time for any reason. And uh, all my kids are so drawn to that gentleness and that servanthood. Uh, number four, he needs you to be present. He needs you to be present. Yeah. Look at me in the eyes, right, Mark? Is right, what your daughter right. said. Face to face, eyeball to eyeball contact. Mm. You know, when I think the why behind this, because I always think mm. about why is that one important? Why does our son mm. need this? Um, because what it's saying to him is what? You are important. Mm. When you are at his football game or his sports uh, game or his uh, music recital or whatever it might be, you just being there. If you didn't say mm-hmm. one word, you being present is the greatest present mm-hmm. because you are saying to him, you are important. There's nothing mm-hmm. more important at this moment in time than for me mm-hmm. to be here, hearing you, watching you, seeing you. Yeah, that's so good. Well, BJ, you said that earlier. You said your dad came and watched three hour practices and just sat there. He never talked to you. He just, but you knew he was there and that probably meant a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah he sm- it, it's kind of funny. It wasn't just me. It was my teammates. My dad smoked these stogies and uh, my teammates would be like, Hey, your dad's here. <laughs> I and smell I mean, <laughs> before, before he, before he even, he would like, before he even actually got there, they'd be like, hey, your dad's here. I'm like, no, he's not. And then all of a sudden, you'd see him come over the hill and come to the – and I'm like, oh. You could smell him coming. Yeah. That is that is fantastic. But, but, but I think it's not just – you know, it's not just a <coughs> physical presence, but it's this emotional presence mm-hmm. that we need. Like, we live in the most distracted time in mm-hmm. history. Like, the, we've got our phones. We've got all these things dinging at us. Well, that thing mm-hmm. demands your attention. Like this, this smartphone that we all carry in our pocket as an extension, like a third hand, like it craves your attention. It demands your eyes. It's, it's just this ever present thing. And you only have so much attention. Mm-hmm. You, you've, you have the capacity to give 100% attention to something. We like to think we can multitask. We're just not good at it. We just can't do it. So any percentage of attention that's not on your kids is you're giving less of them, less to them than they should get, especially in the same room. You know, how many times have, have we sat there and uh, someone's talking to us and we're not really focused, we're thinking about something else, we're paying attention to a phone or whatever, and you look up and you're like, oh man, you, you were talking to me, weren't you? <laughs> and I, I do yeah. it all the time. And so I don't want my kids to think that I have more of a relationship with my cell phone than I do with them. Yeah. And so I, I totally agree. We could put that thing away um, as often as possible. And uh, if you want to take it out when they go to bed, that's probably safer. Um, but I don't want them to have a relationship with the top of my head. No, no, my, that's, a, that's a great way to say it. My daughter, by the way, the other day, um, she, we were all sitting around the TV, all four of us. And uh, all of a sudden, my daughter goes, this, this generation and their phones. This is my 13-year-old. This generation and their phones. And my <laughs> wife and I look up and we're both on our phones and our kids are not. Mm. And I was like, uh, ouch. Oh, yeah. That's dagger. <laughs> dagger. Oh, man. It's, it, it's true. You know, one of the rules we have is not being on the phone um, when we're in the car with our kids, mm. uh, especially with guys. And one of the things I've seen we research uh, is that with guys, when you say, I need you to look at me, it starts flooding their body and their brain with cortisol. It makes them angsty. And the more you say, look at me, look at me, look at me, uh, the more angsty they get. And so there's something about, and guys, this is true with guys and their wives in the car. Guys, when they're not having to look at you, you'll have the best conversations, you know, guys connect shoulder to shoulder so you're going down the road you have those mm-hmm. conversations mm-hmm. with them and so i thought i can't have those shoulder to shoulder conversations with them if i'm on my phone so and somebody told us years ago just just don't be and it's amazing if you can have that car time back mm. um and Good they've point. even said to me they've even said dad you can pick it up you can pick it up and i'll pick it up when it's their mother but nobody else number five he needs you to discipline him in love 
the discipline part is easy, right? <laughs> yeah. I think the in love part is yeah, is the part I have to cuz I the the knee jerk reaction with discipline and that's those are some of the biggest regrets is when I get frustrated with them for doing something I quote unquote that I think is very wrong or wrong. And so I think it's then love and again for me it's the space you said or I need to cool down. And yeah. that's for yeah. me. Yeah, discipline and anger is my spiritual gift. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, it's really quick. <laughs> if you think about all these seven things, this one is really, really focused on us as a father. I mean, because yeah. we gotta we've got to do this one right. Mm -hmm. uh, God disciplines those he loves, the Bible says. And so a father is to do the same thing. We discipline them because we love them. Mm -hmm. And we're disciplining them to really ultimately make disciples mm -hmm. uh, to, yes, to be good men, ultimately to be honorable men, but also um, to walk in Christ's steps, to walk with God, ultimately to be a disciple and to mm. show them how, what discipline and love looks like. Mm. That's good. That's so good. All right. The next one here is he needs your love regardless of his mm. choices. One of my sons, uh, and he wouldn't mind me sharing this. I've shared this story with permission before, is my son Grant, um, who came over and joined our family from Russia. He grew up uh, for nine years without having a father involved in his life. He grew up in the woods, and he, he came to us as a very angry mm. uh, boy at nine years old. And so I'll never forget it. He, uh, he was yelling and screaming in his room. He just was mad about something. And I walked into his room and I was like, what's going on? What's wrong? And whack across the head with a lacrosse stick. And, and I got in his face, my eyes and his eyes, my nose touching his nose. And I said, Grant, I love you no matter what. Do you hear me? No. And he's, mm. you're not my father. You're not my father. I said to him again, Grant. I love you no matter what. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Just like Jesus, he will never leave us or forsake you, us. I will never leave you. I love you no matter what. There's nothing you can do to separate you from my love. And so he then started calming down and calming down. And it wasn't the only time that happened. Well, the lacrosse stick, the only time, but <laughs> it wasn't the only time. But there were many times when I had to get in his face and say, I love you no matter what. There's nothing you can do. Nothing, mm. nothing you can do to separate you from my love. And finally, after years, not weeks or months, he believed me. Mm. Yeah. He believed me and he took it in and he embraced it and that's that was story. an amazing, amazing mm. thing that God did in his life. But every one of our sons has to know, our daughters has to know, mm. we love them no matter what, no matter what bad choices they make. Mm. and Which they will. We all made cho yeah. those choices, right? We've all right. made cho bad choices. No matter what they do, there's nothing that can separate them from our love. They have to know that. It, mm. it is completely, unequivocally unconditional. Mm. So good. And number seven, he needs you to affirm him. How do we affirm mm. our boys? Yeah. What does that look like? Words aren't neutral. They either build up or they tear down. And then we had something funny around our family as our kids were growing up. We'll say, do those words build up or do they tear down? And my kids would say, and I'd say something that was not good. And they say, dad, is those, <laughs> do those words build up or do they tear down? So they would correct me many times. And so basically, we mm. need to give those breathe life-giving words into our sons. They need to hear from us things like, I'm here for you. Mm. I'm proud of you. I believe in you. I want what's the best for you. Yeah. Mm. You've got what it takes. Mm. God's given you every gift that you need as a man. You've got what it takes. Mm. You've got what it takes. They need to hear that continued affirmation from us. And, and by the way, on what you said, it's not just saying, hey, I'm proud of you. And that's good. Don't yeah. get me wrong. That's good. Mm. But I'm proud of you mm. because when our next door neighbor, elderly neighbor, um, she dropped her groceries on the ground, you were the first one. You ran out there. Mm. You picked up her groceries 
and you brought them into your house. That was amazing. I am proud of you. Yeah, what, what I want to affirm with my son is not the things that will come and go. Like, oh, you are a great baseball player. You are a great musician. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's not who you are. That's just what you do. Like, I want to affirm the things that you are. You are valuable. Mm. You are cherished. You are loved. All mm. these things. Because yes. a lot of the other stuff that they maybe find identity in won't last forever. But the stuff that they should find identity in, child of God, someone who is beloved by your family, that needs to be affirmed. Mm. And they need to hear that over and over and over again so that their identity is wrapped up in what really matters and what will last, not the stuff that's fleeting. I kind of see a part of the road being you are a man, kind of this affirmation of who they are as that they have grown into a man and that there's a defining moment where we tell them that, where we tell them you've arrived at this place. Um, I never really had that. My dad passed away when I was 24. There wasn't a ceremonial moment where he kind of told me that. And so there's just always this question mark, like, am I there? Mm -hmm. BJ, I think that is really critical. And uh, we've written some blogs on that about, we, you know, it's called many things, rite of passage in the Hebrew tradition, of course, Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And in the Christian tradition, there's that rite of passage, some people call it. And it's really critical because without that, without that, without that uh, period on that point in time, at the end of, okay, this is the end of this sentence. Now you're starting a new sentence or chapter in your life um, that you are now a man. Uh, that's really important for uh, a son to hear. And for each of our children, sons and daughters, we have had that rite of passage ceremony. Yeah. I'm curious, Mark, When what age were they when you had that ceremony with your kids? It or did it, it vary based it, on it kids? It did depend on the child, but generally speaking, it was during that time frame where the 11 to 13 years old, it was kind of uh, around that time of, of puberty. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, because my daughter's 12, my oldest daughter, I'm like, that's a great idea. Like, at what point does my son or daughter need to have that experience? Is it middle school? Is it as they go into high school? It, it's a really cool idea. Yeah, if, if I was if I was making a decision and I had a choice to do it later, earlier, the er, earlier would be. But they have to be able to understand it. So I think that yeah. time frame. And by the way, uh, can we give a little commercial that we do on the allprodad.com website? Absolutely. Have those resources mm -hmm. uh, and actually the actual ceremonies of exactly what you can do. We can put to that in the show that. notes of the yeah episode. in the show notes. That would be awesome. Well, we always want to give you a bottom line, and we want to make that simple. And today's bottom line is your son needs you, right? Mm -hmm. And you know this. This is mm -hmm. something you already know. Uh, we're not telling you anything you don't, but just this reminder again and again. Boy, they need us. And even when they're pushing us away, mm -hmm. right? Like, Mark, even mm -hmm. when you don't love me, you're not my father, those kind of things are coming out. Uh, they don't know right now how much they do need us. They don't know how to communicate that. They don't have the vocabulary for that, but they, they need us. Uh, and hopefully they can look back one day and go, man, my dad was there. He, he loved me. He wasn't perfect, mm -hmm. uh, but he yeah. loved me. Bobby, as always, we give a pro move. We yeah. want to give you something that's simple, but we also want to give you something that's powerful. So what's yeah. the pro move of this episode? Yeah. You want to be an all pro dad? Here's the pro move you can do this week. It's short and simple. This week, focus on one of the seven things. Don't try to do all of them. I mean, you'll overwhelm yourself if you're trying to do all of them in one week, but just focus on one thing that your son needs. We'll read the list again because it's such a good list. He needs you to love his mother, number one. He needs you to fail and see you fail, not just succeed. Number three, he needs your servant leadership. Four, he needs you to be present. Five, he needs you to discipline him in love. Six, he needs your love regardless of his choices. And seven, he needs you to affirm him. Pick one this week. That's your all pro move. Mm, that's so good. Doesn't it make you want to kind of rush out and, or at least fail your boys right Just now. fail. Just yeah. rush right on out and fail and get a <laughs> yeah. gross dad text back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mess that <laughs> battery up. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you guys. Uh, again, always teaching me. Uh, and thank everybody that's listening right now. We hope today, like every episode, has encouraged you to be an all pro dad. Thanks for listening to the All Pro Dad podcast. All Pro Dad is the fatherhood program of the nonprofit Family First. Along with our motherhood program, iMom, we exist to help you love your family well. Subscribe to our daily email, the All Pro Dad Play of the Day, by going to allprodad.com slash subscribe and get daily powerful and practical fatherhood tips in your inbox. The All Pro Dad podcast is hosted by me, Ted Lowe, produced by Bobby Lewis.